Hi, I'm Talia Baroncelli, and you're watching the analysis.news. I'll shortly be joined by Colonel Larry Wilkerson to speak about 20 years since the United States' invasion of Iraq, as well as relations between Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Israel. If you enjoy this content, please don't hesitate to go to our website, theanalysis.news, and to hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen. You can also get onto our mailing list and go to our YouTube channel, The Analysis News. Please hit the subscribe button there and hit the bell. The bell ensures that you'll be notified every time a new episode drops. That way you won't miss any future episodes due to the algorithm. See you in a bit with Larry. Joining me now is Larry Wilkerson. He's a retired colonel who worked in the US military for 31 years. He also served as chief of staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell between 2002 and 2005, and worked for Powell when Powell was the chairman to the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the first Gulf War. So I'm really happy to have you back on the show, Larry. Good to be with you, Talia. March 20th has marked 20 years since the United States invaded Iraq, and I'd like to ask you what your thoughts are on this tragedy. I said on a Hura, the U.S. Department of State's broadcast into the Arab world the other night, to the interviewer who was asking me questions in Arabic translated in my ear, and he asked me a question he'd asked a lot of other people who come up there, and they had given him a song and dance about how Iraq is great, it's improving, Saddam Hussein's gone. I said, I'll give you one word answer, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. And then I described to him why I thought it was a disaster. Millions displaced, external refugees, internally displaced people, an economy that still hasn't recovered, massive corruption in the government, Iranians and all the militia groups that, uh, that really count, and on and on and on. The oil, oil ministry is corrupt as heck. They haven't even gotten to the place where they should be in terms of oil production. At the end of the interview, which went on for about 20 minutes, he actually got out of his seat and came up to me and said, I want to thank you in English. He said, I want to thank you. And I said, why? He said, because you're the first person that's come on here and told the truth. And, you know, I later said to the MBN and uh, Middle East Broadcast Network, states replacement for Voice of America that goes into the Arab world, the reason, reason Al Arabiya and Al Jazeera and the BBC are beating you in audience share and you only have 2% of the audience share so those people know you're lying to them. They know you're not telling them the truth. If you told them the truth, at least you would get a sizable piece of the audience, maybe 15, 16% of the audience, and maybe grow it because they wouldn't be hearing totally propaganda. It is a disaster. And the Levant, in large measure, is a disaster from Beirut to the other end at the Red Sea in Yemen because largely of what we did in 2003. Started in 1990-91, but finished up in 2003 in a most miserable way. And I don't see it recovering for some time. Now, let me add, many of the neoconservatives who forced that war on an inexperienced president in many respects are, are joyful about it. They're joyful about it because as long as it's in turmoil, Israel is safe. And they would look at you and they would say, okay, Syria was a big threat, Iraq was a big threat, Iraq possibly the biggest threat on the ground with armored forces. Um, Egypt had signed a peace treaty. So we got rid of the others. And Iran, well, we're going to take care of them too. Maybe we'll get to that in the other part of the interview, but that's the way they feel, and they feel the Abraham Accords and the recent mini rapprochement between Tehran and Riyadh are indicative of the fact that Israel doesn't have any enemies left. Au contraire, Israel has many enemies left and is making more. Every day Netanyahu is making more enemies, including his own people. So the region is in turmoil, and we largely are responsible for it. But no one has been held account for it. Nope. What do you think has to be done there? No, nope. the other day someone asked me the question, what I thought about Putin's going before the ICC, were he to be captured and put there? I said, oh, he's got to stand in line because George Bush and Dick Cheney ought to be in front of him. And if it takes my going along with them, you know, if I'm the person who has to go along with them in order to get the, the, the American people to say, put them there, I'll go. I'll go in a heartbeat. Um, they need to be there too. We're the biggest hypocrites on earth.
Well, that's very honorable of you, but I don't think the ICC will ever release any of those uh, arrest warrants for Bush, for Cheney, for anyone. What I found out about the ICC really, really was discouraging. In Paris, with the Germans, we had gone ostensibly to talk to the two French members of the Guantanamo crowd, who had finally been repatriated, guilty of nothing, and sent back to France because we were working on the torture issue. Well, guess who shows up the second day at our conference? The young female prosecutor who was running the case in Afghanistan. And in the first part of her investigatory process, which is very free of prosecutorial restrictions, so they can do almost anything. They can talk to anyone and so forth. They don't, they're not bound by what they, in the second phase, will be bound by, which is really strict uh, limitations on what you can ask and do and so forth. So she told us the full story. And the, the thing she told us about the crimes committed by the United States, by the Afghan government, and by ISAF, the international group, in Afghanistan, were under investigation because they were horrendous. They were absolutely horrendous. Um, and she showed us some of the evidence. And she said, now when I get to the second stage where I have to follow all the rules and everything and make it a, like a grand jury investigation, I'm going to run into problems, but I think I've got enough here to work it out. Next thing I hear about eight months later, she's been boom. <laughs> you know, I heard this in 2002 from John Bolton and others in the State Department. We own the ICC. That's why we don't want to appear to be an associate of it, because we own it. We will prosecute blacks in Africa. They will prosecute blacks in Africa on our behalf. And when we ever find anybody that isn't black, they'll prosecute them too. And lo and behold, what have we come to? Milosevic, Karadzic, and all the, the war criminals in the, amongst the Serbs. So I think there's some truth to that. We do, to, a, to an extent, the ICC does do what we tell them to do. And that's the latest example. You're not going to bring a case against the empire. Well, some of the first cases that were launched by the ICC or in the first arrest warrants they released were against Africans, right? So it yeah. wasn't really a good look. Of course, of course. That's, you know, you can do that. That's fine. Go over there and do that. You know what we did in 2002? We sent John Bolton around the world. And John Bolton is the Undersecretary of State for International Security Affairs, negotiated what we call, I think the term was Article 92. I think that was it. But that's unimportant agreements with each nation he went to. And those agreements said in treaty force between the United States and the capital of that country, we will not prosecute your troops if they ever should be on our soil. <laughs> so we got to get out of jail free card <laughs> with half the countries in the world. And of course, we bent some arms and paid some money to get those agreements. Well, well, speaking of John Bolton, I recently saw an interview with him on Al Jazeera where he was basically defending the U.S.'s position before uh, the war in Iraq and saying, you know, after the first Gulf War, there was no evidence that Saddam had actually gotten rid of all the weapons they had. So that would be some sort of reason to justify an invasion because th there was no proof that those weapons had been destroyed. But obviously what the U.N. inspector said in 2003 was quite different, wasn't it? Well, I tell you, there, there was, Hans Blix was not convinced that there were no weapons. He, in his conversations with Powell, he said, put me there and I will tell you there are no weapons with 95% certitude. And if there are weapons, I'll give you that. Um, John Bolton is forgetting the fact that Bill Clinton bombed Iraq with not iron bombs like we did mostly in the first Gulf War, with PGMs for four days and nights. That did more damage to Iraq than all of the first Gulf War. Remember, the first Gulf War was mostly fought on the Kuwaiti border and the Iraqi border. It wasn't fought. The highway of death was turned off really quickly. So we didn't drop a whole lot on Baghdad or Iraq proper. But what Bill Clinton dropped for four days and nights in his operation virtually destroyed Iraq's infrastructure. And anybody who probably thought they were weapons of mass destruction of consequence had to think, that they were hidden and they were well away. And that's, of course, what the CIA told us. That was the story they gave us. Um, but 
the the real destruction of what was before 1990 the most successful country outside Israel in the Levant, Iraq. People forget that. Women had rights. Women could go to university. It was really a modernizing country. It had Saddam Hussein. That was a shortfall, no doubt, but it still was a modernizing country. And it had a great economy for the Middle East. Um, we set that back. It, it hasn't recovered since, and it probably won't for another two decades. It just reminds me of a, a New York Times article recently. Um, I think the headline was something like, Iraq is freer now compared to before the invasion, but of course, you know, the tragedy is horrible. And that seems to be another justification for the war. I mean, what is freedom? It's all relative, right? And exactly. the destruction that was brought on the Iraqi people during the invasion is definitely not something that can be justifiable. Was that the article by Dump, Duncan? I can't remember. I think it was uh, probably published on March 21st, so a day after. Yeah, New York Times. Yeah. yeah. What, what a preposterous article. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Pro I got a request from Ralph Nader to write a letter to the editor of the New York Times. I haven't gotten back to Ralph yet, but I'm going to tell him I don't talk to the New York Times anymore. They're heathens. And what do you think of the, um, the media's portrayal of the U.S. invasion? Because you, you do see a lot of images of death and destruction. You do see how terrible the invasion was, but does that really sort of portray the extent of it? Not really. You have to look at the ravage that happened afterwards. That was brief, episodic, violent, but over in a very short period of time. The statue came down, and then the, the looting started, and we had a three-star general stand there and say, well, it's not my job to stop the looting. Are you kidding me, General? You just brought this state to its knees and you're not prepared to do anything post-hostilities? And then it started. Uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld would not admit that there was an insurgency going on. Well, it was a hell of an insurgency because we had sent almost all of the Republican Guard out into the hinterland with their weapons and angry as hell and they formed the ranks they did and they began an insurgency and al-Qaeda joined them of course under Abu Musab al-Zarqawi in the beginning and it became a really deadly place to be not just for Americans but for Iraqis too and for Brits and others in the coalition of the willing as Rumsfeld called it. And what would you say about the so-called efforts uh, probably during the war and after the war to account for the public spending that went to you know, either to profits for different military companies that were there or defense contractors. Um, I think Paul Bremer was involved in some of that, right? Yes, very much so. Paul Bremer was a pro-consul who didn't know what the hell he was doing. Just the fact that we put someone there as inexperienced as he was in that sort of activity and didn't speak Arabic. And one of his first acts was to push the most accomplished diplomat in the world who had come there on his own volition, UN-sponsored, Sergio Vieira de Mello, who had been in all the world's danger spots and had been fearless and courageous in all of them and accomplished miracles. Bremer pushes him off into a hotel and, and won't even talk to him hardly, and Al-Qaeda attacks it. Another shortfall of our military effort. We provided for no quick reaction force for such things, as if Al-Qaeda wouldn't do something like that and he dies in the rubble of that hotel on his cell phone and his last words are asking if everyone's been gotten out. He's thinking about the people that were working for him in the hotel and he's killed. We lost a true patriot there, world patriot, global patriot, a Brazilian citizen but a brilliant man. We lost him there and we gained Paul Bremer, an idiot. Wow. Well, let's stay in the Middle East, but move to Saudi Arabia and Iran. They recently signed a deal to reestablish diplomatic ties, and that was, of course, uh, assisted or negotiated by China. How do you think this new deal will affect politics in the region? First of all, it's my good information, and it comes not only from U.S. sources, but from Omani sources. And let me just highlight that, because Oman is the best set of good offices in the world, certainly in the Levant, but I think in the world. They are constantly working for peace in very divisive issues all across the region, and I must say too, sometimes globally. Um, so they had a hand in this. 
They had a hand in the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement with Iran. They helped expedite that. Bill Burns had a hand in it. Bill Burns had been working with the Iranians and the Saudis for some time. So Wang Yi comes along and gets the credit. And I'm not trying to shorten uh, or, or trying to discredit Wang Yi. He's a superb diplomat. But he came along and took an opportunity that was created by pre-work by the Omanis and by Burns and also by the women in Iran who made the Iranian government really scared and it doubted its own legitimacy and well it should have because those women and the men who joined them and the clerics who joined them and all manner of Ira Iranians who joined them discredited that government. That government is true in terms of legitimacy with its own people. 88 million people disavowed that government. And it's just a matter of time till something happens that will be probably the IRGC establishing a military dictatorship, I'm sad to say. But that made the Iranian government much more willing to talk and to seal a deal, if you will, because they were seeking someone, anyone, who would legitimize them. <laughs> you know, they lost legitimacy with their own people, so now they're seeking outside legitimacy. But let me hasten to add that that agreement is nothing more than both sides agreeing to recognize UN principles and protocols with regard to respect for other countries. That's all they did. So there's nothing there really of substance yet. So anyone who thinks that that is a reconciliation between Riyadh and Tehran better look again. And it could blow up at any moment. In fact, the Saudis under MBS could put a Shia and ha put him on the gallows and hang him like they did a few years ago, and the Iranians would, you know, be right back to shooting missiles at them. Uh, and I'm, MBS would do that in a heartbeat. That's the kind of ruler he is. Um, but I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic about it because they did do that, though. The Abraham Accords are there. I think all of this, though, is machinations by the Arabs. And I don't blame them for it. I'm just trying to describe it to put themselves in a position to do major, maximal damage to Israel when the time is ripe. And I put Egypt in that camp, too, even though they've signed a peace treaty. Um, the United States is getting a little tired of bribing Egypt every year with 3 to $4 billion to keep the peace treaty. Um, and so uh, there's got to be some distrust there, and there's got to be some planning on the side for contingencies. So I don't, I don't ever discount the situation of animosity between the Arabs and Israel over the Palestinians at a minimum, but over other things too, like Israel getting all this discounted oil constantly. It started with Mark Rich. Mark Rich, the man Bill Clinton in the last hour of his presidency in an ignominious, cowardly move, pardoned. I mean, Mark Rich was running the, burst, the, the busting of Iraqi sanctions to ship oil to Israel was going to Haifa at discounted prices. Mark Rich is as much responsible for the Israeli economic success in the last 20 years as Netanyahu or anyone else. And Mark Rich went to jail and then Clinton pardoned him. Guess who earned $4 million as a lawyer working for Mark Rich? Scooter Libby, Dick Cheney's chief of staff. Man, this is a convoluted story. These people are all in it together. And everywhere you look is Israel. In the middle of it all is Israel. Um, and if you're looking at the Levant, you have to look at Israel because they're behind a lot of Lebanon's problems, a lot of Syria's problems. And speaking of Syria, look at what we just did. In a country to which we were not invited, in a country which has a recognized, legitimate leader, Bashar al-Assad, however we may think of him, in a country we are illegally occupying a portion of in a country where our troops are around oil that's pumping to Israel in a country we have no business being in it's an international crime to be there we flew jets and shot at people this is crazy right. yeah. to give some context to people who don't know what's going on I, I, I believe that well the Pentagon has said that uh, Iranian backed groups or affiliates have launched drone attacks in northeast Syria, and Biden, in retaliation, um, launched another you know, precision attack on these groups in, in Syria. And, and of course, question, the, And the question is, would they have done that if we weren't there? No. Exactly. Well, I mean, that's the, that begs the question. Like, why are these troops there in the first place on the sovereign territory of, exactly. of Syria? I mean, 
Exactly. And the most important reason they're there is to protect that flow of oil to Israel. And I will bet you, um, I, I'll bet you my last penny that Bashar Assad did not know that oil was going to Israel and would like it to stop. Well, I have a lot to ask you because you've covered a lot of different things now. Um, if you can go back to the Saudi-Iran deal, what was Iraq's role? Because I think some of those discussions did take place in Baghdad. So I, I just wonder, you know, Iraq being, Iraq neighboring Iran, what was their role in, in any of those talks? I think he, Iraq, Iraq wants two things out of Iran. It doesn't want it to leave because it's very important for its economy. There are things, especially around the region that Basra is sort of the center of, there are things the Iranians do that constitute a major portion of Iraq's economy, and to a certain extent, vice versa. So they need that in any country. You, you want to trade with your neighbors if possible. I mean, look where most of our trade is, Mexico and Canada. Most Americans don't even know that, but that's the truth. Um, Iraq wants good relations, economic and financial relations, but they don't want the relations with 100,000 members of militias inside their own borders that are influenced by Iran, and some of them in a very deleterious way, They're injurious to Iraq. Um, they want those gone, so they want a deal. They want to talk. And Why was Soleimani killed in Iraq? Well, one of the reasons he was there was to honcho some talks between these people. You know, it wasn't just all bloodthirsty stuff. He was there to try and work out some deals where the modus of India would be a little bit better. Um, not to say that there wasn't some ulterior motive there, too, that was more military. But that's what Iraq wants. That's what the government now wants. The government now is a little bit better. It's, it's not Maliki killing and hanging Sunnis. Uh, it really is interested in reconciliation of the different groups in Iraq. It's interested in getting the Iranian militias out, and it's interested in limiting some of the corruption. They'll never wipe it all out. It's endemic to that society. But they want to get it in hand so that they can deliver to their people, so they'll get reelected. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, and so, you know, there's a little bit more optimism now about Iraq's future than there was, say, a year or two ago when they were having so many political problems. But that said, Iran has got to become a better, more responsible partner if that's to happen and quit coveting Iraq. Would that mean stop sending, would that mean that they would need to stop sending weapons to some of the groups that are Absolutely. in Iraq? Or what yeah. you suggest? Yeah, and, and every time I say that, I go hypocrite, 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 because who's the biggest arms merchant in the world? The United States of America. Who's the biggest arms merchant single in the world? Lockheed Martin. Well, Saudi Arabia also, you know, is, is still involved in a war in Yemen. And so I wonder how this deal with Iran might impact the war in Yemen. I mean, you've said that you're not very optimistic that this deal with Saudi Arabia and Iran is really much more than some sort of declaration that it might not really lead to anything. But... That might be one place that you just mentioned, Yemen, where it is very positive and quicker rather than later, because Oman was very much interested in that, and I'm sure the Sultan and his boys um, made that a major issue, because they want to see that brutal war stop, and they want the Saudis to get out of it and quit killing people and quit making it so difficult for Yemenis to even exist, let alone prosper. Um, so. I could see that as being the number one reason they offered their good offices and therefore being a, a possible accomplishment. The Saudis are trying to get their get that get out, but they want to maintain some sort of, oh man, I mean, remember he was a defense minister when he did this. He, he, this is all MBS. This is his whole ball game. So he's got to save face, and that means that the Houthis have to give a little as he gives, hopefully. Um, I hope the food is restored. I hope the ports are restored. It looks like they're going to be. So this could be a really positive and rather swift development of this rapprochement, if you will, that we get the war in Yemen ended. The Congress is getting ready again to try the war powers resolution and cut Saudi Arabia off from U.S. help altogether. So that's putting a little pressure on MBS, too. I hope that's enough to get this war stopped. What does MBS actually gain from this blockade of, of Yemen, though? 
like, just from a sheer geopolitical perspective in terms of Saudi Arabia's interests? It's become a stature thing for him, and that's the worst thing you can do to a war, is make it stature and prestige for the leader of the main effort in that war, because then you can never get them to stop. But originally, I think it had to do with a number of things, one of which was the Saudi Arabian desire to build a pipeline across that portion of Yemen to the Red Sea and therefore negate to an extent the strategic importance of the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. But they couldn't do it because they wouldn't let them. So there are all kinds of geostrategic reasons that Saudi Arabia wanted to do what it did, and it ran into a buzzsaw when it did it. People generally don't, no matter how weak they are, they generally don't like you crossing their border and killing them to make your point. Right. Well, you pointed out recently that um, there's a national security document which was also um, approved by President Joe Biden, which essentially moves um, Israel from U.S. Uh, European command to U.S. Central Command in the Middle East. Right. What does that mean for military operations in the Middle East? What are the implications there? It means that we've changed 50 years of U.S. policy, which was rather adamant. <laughs> never put Israel in Central Command's area of responsibility because it would be all Arabs with Israel. Now, you could say, well, this was made possible by the Abraham Accords, you know. Okay, everybody's becoming friendly with Israel now, so we can put Israel in that command. Well, what would you put them in there for? Who are you going to attack? Who are you going to fight? What's the war going to be? It's going to be Israel and the Arabs versus Iran. That's another motivator for Iran to do what it did, because Iran's not stupid, it can see that happening. And it knows we changed the UCP. More dire than that, though, is when I saw that change, a change Colin Powell had fought against, a change George Marshall had started to fight against in 1947 and 48. When I saw that change, I said, okay, three possibilities here. Israel's going to attack Iran and we're going to follow. We're going to attack Iran and Israel's going to follow, or we're going to attack Iran together. And that's why we've consolidated and put Israel in the command that's going to be in charge of the war. That's the most dire interpretation of it, and I'm really worried that that might be the accurate interpretation of it. I think Netanyahu has thrown a monkey wrench in that recently, though, because he no longer seems in control of Israel. He's certainly not in control of those 100,000 or so people who come out in the streets almost daily. Um, and I'm not even sure he's in control of his own government. So that may put a little fly in the ointment there in terms of those plans. Well, it does seem like the U.S. has been supporting Bibi Netanyahu's very aggressive policy towards Iran. I mean, Tom Nye, the ambassador, was making some comments saying that, you know, Israel can basically do whatever they want to defend themselves when it comes to Iran. But I think recently um, an Israeli ambassador was recalled to New York, I think it was, to speak about um, some of the activity in the occupied territories dealing with you know, legal settlements. Um, so I, I do wonder what's going on right now between the US and Israel and how tricky things are, or if that's just something that's, you know, th that, that's a media portrayal and everything is actually okay under the surface. Well, when Shel Sheldon Adelson's wife Miriam came out and criticized Netanyahu, that, that was a, a, a barn burner for me. I mean, to see her come out, she was, she was I'm told, I don't know her personally, but I'm told she was even hard -ass, more hard-ass than uh, Sheldon himself with regard to Israel, right or wrong, Israel. Um, and for her to come out and criticize Netanyahu says something, I think. Um, and there is a real falling away right now of Jewish Americans of note with wealth from Netanyahu. Whether that translates into falling away from Israel proper is another matter. I think it depends on how long he stays there. And if he's successful in dismantling the Israeli legal system, which is what he's trying to do. And why is he trying to do it? They all know why he's doing it. He's doing it to keep himself out of jail, and his wife too, out of jail. That's why he's doing it. It has nothing to do with Israel's security and everything to do with Bibi's security. 
So this is really causing some rancor amongst uh, American Jews who are otherwise supporters of Israel. If that keeps up, Biden's not going to be able to ignore it. What do you think Biden is thinking right now? I mean, does he feel uncomfortable given the situation in Israel? I mean, people have been protesting on the streets. Lloyd Austin, when he went to visit um, Netanyahu, I think he had to have the discussion with him in the airport because there were so many people protesting that they blocked the roads to the airport. Um, and obviously, the Israeli Knesset just... Well, maybe Netanyahu has made it possible for the Israeli Knesset to overturn Supreme Court rulings if they have a 61-seat majority. Um, so he's basically undermining Israeli democracy. How long do you think he's going to last doing this? And, and what you just said he's doing with a paper-thin majority. A paper-thin one. So it's not the bulk of the Israeli people who are behind these efforts. In fact, I think we're seeing that the bulk of the Israeli people are against these efforts. If he succeeds, if he proceeds, if he goes ahead, if he does it, we're in trouble. Because all Biden can do is either hold his nose, close his eyes, put his fingers in his ears, and say, Israel, right or wrong, and go right into Armageddon, or take some action. And I don't see Biden being smart enough or brave enough to take action. Primarily because he's afraid of the 2024 election and what it might do to him. My students used to look at all these case studies since World War II, which I, we would use as examples of the empire in the world, you know, all the way from Korea to the present day. And they would ask me questions like this. Are we the only country in the world that makes national security decisions based on democratic and republican political considerations? <laughs> I would say, what do you think? I think we are. <laughs> Because we do, from time to time, make decisions that are based uh, almost expressly on security and foreign policy decisions, our political situation in this country. And then the critic of that would say, well, that's what democracies do. And then you say, that's what democracies do who want to commit suicide. Well, speaking about nuclear winter and committing suicide, I do wonder if the Israelis really believe that Iran poses a threat to them, or if it's all just a discursive tool that they can use to pursue certain policies. And when I say that, I mean with regards to the fact that they have nuclear weapons, but they're constantly going on about Iranians... Um, the enrichment facilities, the, the uh, sorry, the enrichment of uranium, how it's reached 84% or something in, in the um, Fenrose uh, facility, I believe it was called. And if they actually, if Israel has nuclear weapons capabilities, why would they really be worried about Iran? Because just according to that logic, which is, you know, I, I guess you could criticize mutual deterrence theory, but according to mutual deterrence theory, if Iran were to launch an attack against Israel, then they'd be wiped out by Israel, by virtue of Israel launching an attack right back at them. So do you think they're really worried about in a, Iran? You're right. In a purely rational sense, you are right that Tehran would disappear. I mean, it'd be no more capital of Iran and lots of other places, too, from Isfahan to Bandar Abbas. Um, they have somewhere between 200 and 300 weapons. And there's no doubt in my mind that they would use them. Particularly if Iran used one on them first. Or if they even thought one was coming in on them. We'd have our first example of launch on warning and it would come from Jerusalem. But it's not about that. It's not about logic. It's not about rationality. It's about Netanyahu's political needs. He has to have a bugbear. He has to have a threat. Much the same way we have to have China as a threat now. And Russia thrown in for good luck. Well, for bad luck. You've got to have an enemy. You've got to have an enemy to bait, an enemy to justify your defense budget, an enemy to justify your hegemony. You have to have. And so he's got one now, and he's not going to turn loose of it, regardless of the irrationality of that enemy. The second point is... And this is a bigger geopolitical point. You either come down on the side of proliferation of nuclear weapons 
or on the side of non-proliferation. So let's just take an example with North Korea. South Korea is now talking, its new president is now talking about having his own nuclear weapons capability. I don't think he's serious because you ask him two really important questions. Where are you going to put your waste and where are you going to test? There is no Korean province that is going to give him the right to do that, I guarantee you. And so maybe he's just doing this for political pressure on Washington to make us put more nuclear weapons or put our nuclear weapons back on the peninsula. But still, if he were to develop one, if I'm wrong and he were to develop one, Japan would go nuclear right, right immediately. Japan's plutonium is weapons grade now. Korea would have to just establish a reprocessing capability. Japan has the best plutonium in the world. Everyone wants to buy Japan's plutonium. France buys it <laughs> for its reactors. Japan would be full up nuclear overnight. Then you have two more nuclear powers in Northeast Asia. China would then build out completely. They'd go to six, 7,000 warheads. So that's proliferation. Now let's go back to the Levant. Iran gets a nuclear weapon. The, pa the, the Pakistanis have already, I guarantee you, in the AQ Khan network that we sort of broke up back in the early 2000s, father of the Pakistani nuclear weapon, AQ Khan. Um, mm. in, that, in that network, the North Koreans and the Iranians colluded. We know that for a fact. They colluded over missile uh, warheads and nose cones, and missile throw weights, and underground operations. Now, the Iranians already have sufficient enriched uranium to make a bomb. I found that out yesterday. I did not know that until I talked to the nuclear physicist I most mm -hmm. trust. It would be a dirty one. It wouldn't be as efficient as it, as it should be if you would have really wanted maximum efficiency. But they could take the 66 to 70 percent uranium enrichment they have right now, and they could make a bomb. Do they want to go further? Probably. But if they did, and the Israelis announced it and weren't able to stop it. Let's say the Iranians even went ahead as the North Koreans did, and they've been taught, they've got the mountains in the Zagros Mountains, they can go deep underground just like the North Koreans did. When the North Koreans exploded their first nuclear device, we didn't know for sure if it was a nuclear device. Our sniffers in the air could detect no radiation, and the seismic people, I think they're in Geneva, that monitor the earth for earthquakes and so forth, said, yeah, Something happened there, but it could have been a small earthquake. Might not have been a small nuclear weapon. So for the first test, we didn't know. We really did not know whether they tested or not. The second one, we got a little snip, and we knew that they had tested a nuclear weapon. It was a little bit bigger yield. Um, the Iranians would do the same thing. They'd go underground. My point is, when they did do something that was announceable, and the media would pick, it, pick up on it and run it all over the place, you know, then Saudi Arabia would say to Pakistan, our contract for 30 weapons, execute it. And Saudi Arabia would have nuclear weapons overnight. I guarantee you they would have nuclear weapons overnight. Anyone with that much money, they'd drop it on Islamabad and they'd buy the nuclear weapons. So then you got two new nuclear powers in the Gulf, plus Israel. Guess what would happen with other countries like Syria, maybe, that would say, well, I need a nuclear capability too, and I just don't want to start that race. So you think that a, a nuclear arms race in the Middle East is alive and well? It could be, especially if the IRGC, which I'm told is the authority now, not the Ayatollah, the IRGC, if they decide that they're going to make a run for a bomb, we're going to have a nuclear Iran. Nuclear weapon Iran, I should say. Well, given the, the breakdown and talks between um, the U.S., Europe, and Iran on the, the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, do you think there's any chance that they'll ever, that, well, that the U.S. will rejoin the deal and that, that the Iranians will agree to certain conditions? I mean, the Iranians have been upholding yeah. most of their part of the deal, with the exception of the fact that they've continued to enrich, but it wasn't the Iranians who pulled out of the deal. It was actually the Americans under Trump. We um, abrogated so. it. We, 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 we violated international law. You know, we're the empire. We can do that, right? Yeah. We're also the biggest hypocrite on the face of the earth. Trump violated international law when he violated that agreement. I don't care whether the Senate approved it or not as a formal treaty. He violated international. Those, those agreements have international force. So he did that. 
Um, I'm told right now, very disappointingly, very sadly, about 48 hours ago, that the President of the United States is in a position where he feels politically it will hurt him if he were to try to close a deal. Not that he could, but let's just say he could, possibly, that he doesn't want to now. Um, and I can understand that from a political point of view. These women have just done what they've done. Many of them have been killed or injured or jailed. Children have been killed or injured or jailed. Um, what would he look like to the American people who are dumber than shit anyway, pardon my French, um, what would he look like if he's running for president and he's the guy that went ahead after all these women did all they did and didn't succeed and made an agreement with their government against which they were protesting? That the political environment, in other words, is militating against Biden even wanting a deal now. I was very, very saddened to hear that, but I heard it from a fairly reliable source. But do you think he still had intentions to... Um, assist the signing or the rejoining of the U.S. into the deal before the protest started in Iran because it seemed like he wasn't really interested compared to yeah. campaign promises that he made before. I agree. It didn't seem like either side was really interested in it. Us, because we were insisting on including things that we knew the Iranians wouldn't include, and them because they were insisted on relieving the designation of the IRGC as a terrorist group. Um, because I knew we weren't going to back off of that. Maybe we could sign a deal that would say we'd back off of it in six months or a year if they were, you know, compl complying with the deal. But I don't think we could sign one that said, okay, we'll give you a concession, we'll take them off the terrorist list, and I'll sign the agree agreement. So those kinds of things were holding it up. And it didn't seem to me, the reports I was getting, it didn't seem to me like either side was really seriously interested in resuming it. Both sides seem to have reservations, and I don't blame the Iranians. After all, DeSantis could come in. They could sign up, start again. DeSantis come in in two years and negate it again. I wouldn't sign a deal with the United States if I were any country in the world. Right, and it's, in my view at least, it's because the U.S. Uh, backed out of the deal that yep. uh, Ibrahim Riyas, uh, sorry, Ra Raisi came to power. I don't think Raisi would have come to power in Iran if the U.S. had actually upheld their part of the agreement because a lot of people, especially the hardliners in Iran, were, were saying, well, look, why should we trust the Americans anyway? Exactly. Exactly. I, think lots, of, I think lots of other governments around the world are saying that sort of thing, too. Why would I ever want to sign an agreement with Washington? Look at what they did. The hypocrisy, especially in light of the 20-year mark of the invasion of Iraq, is just unbelievable. And to bring it full circle, and to, to go back to Iraq and the U.S.'s invasion, what lessons do you think still need to be learned by the U.S.? I really try to shape, shy away from that term, lessons learned, because as a military officer, I always taught my war gamers and simulators, you gain insights. You don't learn lessons because lessons learned are, I know two plus two equals four, and in the future it will always equal four. That's a lesson learned. There are no things like that in geopolitics. It, you, you get insights. Mostly you get insights into people and into the way people interact and the way countries perform through those people. I think the insights we've gotten is, one, we're incompetent. We are utterly incompetent, militarily and security-wise in general. So why embark on programs, actions, policies that display that incompetence and weaken us even further? What do I mean by that? Well, take Afghanistan, for example. Had we gone into Afghanistan, spent six months bashing the Taliban about the ears, getting as much of al-Qaeda as we could, and then come to Kabul and said, it's all yours now, we're leaving. If you let them back, we'll come back and bash you again. And not try to do nation building, democracy spreading. The Afghans don't want what we were offering them, neither do the Iraqis. They've got their own version of what they're gonna create in Iraq, and I listened to it the other day, and I, was, I thought it was pretty reasonable. Um, 
So that's the first thing. The second thing is, the second insight gained is we treat our allies like dog shit. Pardon my French again. We do. We treat our allies. This command down in Tampa called U.S. Central Command, you know what they were calling themselves? They're calling themselves a coalition because they have 32 nations down there, from Albania to Japan to Italy, and they're all staff members down there. Well, let me tell you what I heard the last time I went to Tampa from one of those members whose name and country I won't mention. We're never told anything. We're kept in a corner and fed dirt because that's the way the United States operates. We're just down there for a patina of internationalism, a patina of cooperation. Central Command does what Central Command wants to do, and so does Special Operations Command, which is right there in Tampa, too. So this is a, 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 a facade of international cooperation, but at the same time, it's an indicator of how we operate now. We need to really use friends and allies, not abuse them, use them, not in a pejorative way, but in a way that emphasizes their strengths, because some of them have some real talents, whereas we don't. The Norwegians come to mind immediately. Um, what did we do with the Norwegians in Libya? We let them lead the airstrikes. Are you kidding me? We're trying to corrupt Norway. We let their young pilots, because they were so eager, eager to get out there and be top gun, we let them lead the airstrikes in Libya, a war crime. We let them do that and corrupted Norway in that sense, in my view. And a lot of Norwegians feel that way too. Not their government right now, but a lot of Norwegians feel that way. We're, use your allies well. Use them for their competencies. If you're going to have them, use them. Don't abuse them. And then the third insight, I would say, is don't deal with countries in a significant way about which you are totally and utterly ignorant. And don't, for example, try to make Thomas Jefferson Democrats of them. They probably have their own way of doing things, and inevitably, they will do whatever they need to do better than you. I think the women of Iran just proved that. The most effective force in Iran right now. And they will eventually get their way if a bunch of men, corrupt as hell, don't stop them. Well, Larry Wilkerson, it was great to have you on the show again. Thank you very much for making time. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching TheAnalysis.News. Please go to our YouTube channel, TheAnalysis-News, and sub subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button on all the videos you'd like to watch, and hit the bell. That way you'll be informed of future content. If you don't hit the bell, you might be missing some of the epi episodes once they drop, so please do that. And if you're so inclined, also go to our website, TheAnalysis.News, and hit the donate button. That way you can support the work we're doing. Thank you very much.